We have to think about in terms of getting through the planetary emergency and using technology, thinking about innovation, inclusion, high tech, any tech <laughs> to, to make sure we have the tools to get through the planetary emergency. So what I'll do is I'll just give a very brief uh, PowerPoint and uh, background to the commission. We just released the report on November 28th, and then I will introduce our amazing speakers and panelists today. So I'll just pull up my PowerPoint and welcome to those joining online as well. So the Climate Governance Commission established in 2019, our first strategy meeting was in Seoul, South Korea, at Ban Ki-moon's Global Green Growth Institute. Since then, we've moved into a high level phase that includes Mary Robinson, who's the chair of the elders, serving as a chair of the commission, other elders, uh, former president of, of Mexico, Liberia, um, among other figures, leading thought leaders like Johan Rockström as a scientist from the Potsdam Institute, to think about how do we use an innovation perspective to strengthen our current climate governance and then also build the institutions for next generation governance. Due to the gravity of our current climate emergency, we shall have to think about probably sooner than we, when we, than we think at the moment. So what are the gaps in current planetary governance? Uh, IPCC, this was in 2018 already. Uh, climate crisis requires rapid global action to transform the world economy at a speed and on a scale unprecedented in human history. So you can see why we need innovation, uh, technology, also inclusion to get the ideas of all citizen assemblies, for example, are getting more and more uh, popular. We need excellent communications, outreach using uh, our, our social media capacity. So we're addressing, of course, not just the climate crisis, but the triple planetary crisis as UNEP, the Secretary General has, has noted climate change, biodiversity uh, loss and pollution. And we need uh, measures and mechanisms to fill the gap, uh, to, to really tighten the screws on our governance, to make sure we meet this really historic challenge. So we've overstepped, of course, six of the nine planetary boundaries scientifically uh, defined, and we have a very, very, very narrow window if we have any chance to keep within the 1.5 degree temperature limitation target as set out in the Paris Agreement. And the most likely scenarios now are that we will overshoot this 1.5 uh, centigrade centigrade limit about 2035. Uh, uh, and we'll have to draw down by the end of the century. So we are going to have to use all our innovation, ingenuity, and uh, really think current architecture, how we strengthen it, and then next generation governance, how we put that in place. So we re please, re released our uh, re major report with a high level phase with all of our high level, level commissioners, 28th November, just a few days ago, and brings together a number of years of, of really intense stakeholder and expert consultation. And we have 10 near term proposals, how we strengthen existing governance and uh, five medium term next generation governance proposals. Here's just a slide with our top 10 near term. And uh, we just had a meeting this morning about improving cl the climate cops. Uh, David Obura is going to talk about four, how do we enhance our international scientific capacity for Earth system governance. And uh, Alan will talk to us later about how we put in place the smart coalitions advocacy to achieve these various near term and the longer term governance innovation proposals. Already in 2009, Angela Merkel and Nicolas Sarkozy uh, suggested we need a global environment agency to defragment our really fragmented international environmental governance architecture. So we have to start really getting get serious about how we, we plan, have focused expert discussions about planning for such workable, acceptable institutions. 
So uh, I'll leave it to Alan to talk about the Smart Coalition <laughs> building later uh, today. Um, but we very much intend to uh, work with stakeholders, partners to look at these, these various proposals, near term levers, longer term levers, and to um, engage at key summits, summit of the future, of course, ongoing uh, COPs, not just the climate COP, biodiversity COP, et cetera, and, and build uh, a smart coalition engagement of civil society groups and like minded states. So uh, just Again, to reiterate, uh, we, we are in a planetary emergency. This is technically the, the diagnosis of, of the most recent science of the highest excellence. We are not uh, on yet a, a workable path. We're on a path at the moment to catastrophic climate change. So it is our view that we have to address uh, the governance levers to, to ensure we have proper Earth system governance uh, for the entire planet, planetary boundaries, to make sure we have governance of scientific integrity. So I will end there, just as a broad overview of the commission, and we're going to now be diving into our uh, speakers who will look at this topic from a different ang uh, various different angles. So first, I'd like to ask Sylvia Carlson Vinkhausen to join on line, and Sylvia, whoops, hello. I'm happy to be here um, and hope to see Sorry, some Sylvia, of you. I'll just mention Sylvia. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, <laughs> just wanted to introduce you. She's an associate professor with the Public Administration and Policy Group of Wageningen University in the Netherlands. And she's going to talk from a political science law perspective. How do we uh, strengthen accountability in an existing architecture using sort of an innovation governance innovation approach and Sylvia you have seven minutes and we're going to wave at you just because we have quite a full panel so Sylvia over to you first thank you very much I hope you can see my slides mm. yes we can, can see my slides? yeah so I'm I'm really happy to be here to share some ideas about how we could innovate accountability mechanisms for global goals, for example, those that we have adopted in the Paris Agreement and in the Kunming uh, Montreal uh, Global Biodiversity Framework. So I have developed these ideas together with Dr. Arthur Dahl from the International Environment Forum. We have fed some of these ideas to uh, the Climate Governance Commission's report, and we also are going to publish them in a separate policy brief if anyone is interested later. So my first question is, why focus on accountability? Well, we have a situation where we have adopted many multilateral environmental agreements that contain a lot of goals, but degradation of the planetary environment continues to accelerate. Compliance and implementation are clearly insufficient, and so is, of course, goal achievement. So, at the same time, we expect that strong accountability mechanisms could improve performance, could improve how actors act. That is uh, the amount of actions of states. We expect this. Uh, I mean, this is what we are used to at the national level. Um, here, we uh, expect that if actors do not follow laws or their political um, promises, they have to answer up. They have to face consequences. But for international agreements, the follow up mechanisms in these, they have no courts, no sanctions. And they are primarily explicitly facilitative. They are focused on helping implementation. So that's the starting condition. But why is that the case? Well, because sovereign states do not accept that they are accountable to anyone outside their territory. They consider accountability mechanisms for international law um, that they have themselves voluntarily signed up to, to threaten their uh, national sovereignty. So they're very sensitive about creating accountability mechanisms. So in this situation, we propose that there are three options to strengthen accountability for global goals. On the one hand, you can do certain things on the in the short term. You can increase the effectiveness of facilitative mechanisms. You can increase the use of more coercive, informal and formal accountability me mechanisms outside the agreements themselves. And on the long term, you could persuade states to agree to stronger sanction based mechanisms. So, given the strong resistance to the long term option, let's see what we could do for the 1st, 2. We have 
here at the COP, we are going through the final phase of the global stock take. It's a kind of form of global collective, but very facilitative accountability mechanism for all the parties of the Paris Agreement. So here parties have to judge themselves as a collective if they have done what they should to meet the overall objectives of the agreement. And if they haven't done what they should, each party is actually obliged to, according to the agreement, to let this conclusion inform the development of their next national climate plans, the nationally determined contributions. So this is a form of globally prescribed self-accountability for states. The question is, of course, if states are able to do the necessary honest and deep reflection um, about what their responsibility is for the plight of the climate system and, of course, then for those who depend on it, the planet and humanity and all life uh, on the planet. So what we suggest is a number of um, innovations that could support, enable, or perhaps even push states to do a better job at such self-accountability exercises. And these innovations draw on research in institutional design for very complex policy problems. And the first may sound vague, our first proposal, but it is still very important. It's really that we uh, help build the story on moral responsibility uh, so that uh, states have to answer up not only for the few obligations in these agreements that are legal, but for the whole overall uh, measures that they have signed up to. Um, and for this, we can support the analysis um, uh, of how to enable states to consider this moral uh, responsibility. And this is focused um, in our second um, proposal. We have to encourage ways to support the account holding of both like how much states are trying to act, but also if what they do actually lead to the outcomes that is needed. So we have to make accountability work for both the efforts and the outcomes. And having a more solid base for evaluating the outcome, uh, the impact of the nationally determined contributions is one important helpful tool here. And we suggest that we could create an independent global scientific advisory council that would be composed of scientists representing all relevant disciplines, natural scientists, social scientists, humanities, and indigenous and local knowledge. And their mandate would really be similar to the national councils that exist in many countries now to support the implementation of national climate laws. So based on the formally adopted goals on uh, outcomes of IPCC reports and um, the global stock take, they, this council could divide the available carbon budget on diverse and very transparent criteria. And if um, this council gains sufficient legitimacy based on its membership, integrity and quality of the work, it can provide advocacy tools to hold individual governments to account for uh, those NDCs that fall short of, their, of what they should be. We could also focus accountability on the quality of the national policy process. So not only the ambition levels, NDCs, but also um, how are they developed? How inclusive are the processes? How much based are they on appropriate knowledge? And we can also uh, try to uh, do more with the accountability mechanisms we have uh, to, that make, to make sure that they enable learning. For example, build on the best practices to create peer to peer learning among countries in the same regions. Finally, we can also um, identify very concrete mechanisms to tie the facilitative accountability mechanisms to tangible tailor made support for countries to really help those who are struggling uh, with the means and capacity to develop. Um, uh, climate action that they also get that. So, in summary, uh, we think our suggestions, many more than we have here, can strengthen accountability for global goals. But we are also convinced that if no efforts are addressing the deeper changes, such as enabling majority voting, and uh, which means if erosion of the de facto veto right that every country now has in the Paris Agreement and other international agreements, 
then if we don't address this, it will be very difficult. We will really not be able to establish the kind of strong accountability for global goals that the planet and humanity needs. Thank you very much. Yeah, and you stayed exactly in time. <laughs> so very, very much appreciated. Thank you so much for joining us uh, remotely. And we'll maybe come back to some of your excellent suggestions and points, many of which are, are already reflected in the Climate Governance Commission report at the end when we have time for questions. So let's now turn to our in-person speakers. First, let's go to Sika Bas Basin, <laughs> UNEP Cool Coalition Advisor at the Council on Energy, Environment, Water, CEW, based in New Delhi. And CEW has been an amazing partner of the Commission right from the beginning. So welcome, Sika, and over to you. Thank you so much, and uh, I'm Shikha. Uh, no, that's fine. Um, and just to clarify, yes, I am with the Council on Energy, Environment and Water, and I'm speaking here very much today as that and not as UNEP. I just wanted to give that disclaimer. Um, so I want to talk to you all about how uh, we were called the new kids on the block. We were the nifty new organization in the think tank world in India. Um, this is the Council on Energy, Environment and Water. Um, the founder CEO, Dr. Arnaba Ghosh, is part of the Governance Commission. And um, when I started to work with them about seven and a half years ago, uh, we were less than 20 people. Um, but to me, it seemed like it was the only independent think tank that really existed in India where there was no corporate financing. All of the work that they were doing for government was done pro bono. It was all basically philanthropy and like third party projects that were funding us. Um, and that's the reason I joined them. And I started working on something called sustainable cooling, um, which I actually learned about on the job, right? So the Montreal Protocol that came to be uh, to take care of the ozone layer, the gases um, that were no longer ozone depleting substances turned out at a molecular level to be thousands of times more potent uh, as compared to carbon dioxide. Um, and India, along with a host of other developing countries at that point, this is 2015, was coming under immense pressure uh, to sign up to what became the Kigali Amendment. Um, and so before I joined, uh, my colleagues had already done a study to understand what was the business appetite for a think tank in India to really come up with work that could respond to this pressure that was being faced. And when they did the digging around, we found that there was only one paper that had put forward that developing countries' uh, carbon dioxide emissions, like greenhouse gas emissions, by mid-century just from cooling nationally would be about 25% of the pie. Now for India, of course, everyone was therefore putting that kind of pressure on India, right? Because 25% of India's emissions to come from HFC, of course, they want India to sign up to it. But when we ran the numbers, we realized that that data for India was not going to exceed 7% at most, right? So armed with that muddling information, suddenly the government of India felt like they had a negotiation position then, you see, because the reason that that number was not going to be 25% for India is because people in India are still really poor and cannot access or afford an air conditioner or a refrigerator, appliances which predominantly run on refrigeration. Um, so I think that's the first big building block that CW created. And I'm speaking to you about the cooling sector because that's the one I know um, really well and is very close to my heart. But this is the sort of work that CW has done across spaces, whether it's renewable energy, whether it's about decentralized renewable energy, um, moving towards hydrogen now, so on and so forth, but I'll come to that in a minute. Um, and so once the government of India realized that we were not uh, taking international philanthropic money to try and push for a Western cause, because that's how they viewed us initially, um, we established that trust and the Kigali Amendment actually came to be, and it, excuse me, it was the first time that developing countries were broken up into two groups of countries, right? So India, along with a lot of the Middle East, became a part of the hot ambient temperature groups of countries because the, the technologies that were known at the time had never been tested in such environments. And so government of India was able to kind of demonstrate leadership on behalf of a lot of developing countries to position a commitment that uh, still gets us exactly where we need to go. And so 
cumulatively, we will be averting at least 0 0.5 degrees of temperature increase by getting HFCs out of our production and consumption systems. But once we had the agreement, um, closer home, we started thinking about now, what do we do with this, right? We, we know we need to get there, but we also know that the majority of India doesn't have access to cold chains, like 90% of the cold chain that India needs doesn't exist. Less than 8% of the households have access to an air conditioner. Um, and we're a really hot country, you know? So we started talking to the Ministry of Environment about let's take the Kigali Amendment and let's take our climate commitments and come up with something that actually works for India's development. And the world saw for the first time a national cooling action plan. So um, my team and I are co-authors of that report where we worked on uh, the research and development segment and we worked on the service sector in a big way. Um, and we got um, a lot of civil society members together to engage with a host of other ministries to understand what the challenges were. And um, once the plan came to be, we actually switched tracks to start getting other ministries on board. And that's where our strategic communications team really came in because cooling is not something that is mainstreamed at all. Cooling is a subject that most people don't, I mean, it's, it's not very sexy, let's be honest, um, you know, but it impacts your agriculture, your industry, uh, your household, your productivity, you know, your livelihoods program, so on and so forth. Um, and so we came out with movies. Um, we came out with documentaries. We did consumer awareness programs so that people hire the right kind of people to do their servicing and buy the right kind of appliances. Um, and all of this was backed by ground level data that we brought up uh, to the national level, which is now feeding in. I'm happy to say that India is already showing a way faster transition than what it had imagined back in 2016. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a job well done for a nifty little organization uh, supporting the government of India in making sure it's championing sustainable cooling. So I'll stop that. <laughs> Thanks so much. That was fascinating and really inspiring. And we'll come back to you also for questions, hopefully, at the end. So next, let's turn to Drew Jones, who's executive director and co-founder of Climate Interactive, co-developer of En-ROADS with MIT Sloan Sustainability Initiative. Drew, over to you. Could I get a hand switching this over to the proper site? Hey, everybody. Morning. Yeah, happy to be here. My name is Drew Jones and I'm the Executive Director of Climate Interactive. We're a US-based nonprofit think tank, and I'm here with our Director of Modeling Technology, Josh Lohman. So meet him afterwards if you wanna chat more, particularly about what's underneath the hood of this fast-running, slick race car that you're looking at, which is our simulator En-ROADS. We built it in partnership and collaboration with MIT's Sloan School of Management. And stepping back, governance. Governance is often the challenge of making the distinction between high leverage, high priority actions, and low. What is really gonna turn the curve, bend the curve, say, on greenhouse gas net emissions and temperature, and what's not? And one thing we've learned in when modelers like our team come up with insights, we write reports, we put it out, have research that's out there, and yet we find, as John Sturman, our collaborator at MIT says, research shows that showing people research doesn't work. It's sad but true. What does work is creating experiences like we're about to have for the next five minutes and 15 seconds of learning for yourself about the distinction between high priority and low priority actions. So this is a global simulator. So let's just, and it's really an offer to you. Here it is, it's free, it's online. There's a whole course on how to use it. It is in 20 languages because Josh's team is outrageous good at getting this to people around the world. So go try it, 
We have 700,000 users around the world right now. So really quickly, it plays out a world where we have coal, oil, gas, a growing wedge of wind and solar for ray, biomass, and nuclear. Greenhouse gas emissions flatten over time, but they don't fall as much as we know they need to. And if they're going up, and a fairly conservative 3.3, try to get rid of it, um, future, if we don't, oh boy, if we, Okay, <laughs> sorry. There's that funny black line over my temperature. I'm trying to get rid of. Okay, great. So this is where we're headed. What should we do? You can propose things at the bottom. What are some things that are high leverage that actually would bend the curve? We've got three minutes to get down well below two degrees. What do you got? What should we do? Yes, well, that wasn't a hand, that was it. Yeah, what do you like? Get rid of coal. So there's the simple version where you could just move these sliders, but you hit those dots and we have the full get rid of coal. I hope it pops up. Um, button here. I'm not so good with your mouse. Yeah, we do. And so down here, it says, hey, yeah, we can get rid of coal. You want to get rid of coal? Reduce new coal infrastructure. Watch that. Ray, there it is. See it go down? The brown line went down and it helped a good bit. Is it a silver bullet? Did it solve the whole problem? No. In fact, it set a little demand over to natural gas. And so we actually have a little bit of a squeeze the balloon. Oh, I did it. Um, if you could send me, oh, I think I have it right here. Uh, and it set lots of the little blue wedge, actually grew a little bit. It expands, we shift a little demand over there. It's a tightly coupled system. Ah, it also sent some to renewables. The math that sent it to both, and we can go and look and see it sent some to gas. And did it send some to renewables? Let's go look. Oh yeah, the blue line above the black line. So it sent some to gas. It sends some to renewables when you have less coal. What are the, yeah, yeah. And it's all going to renewables. Yeah. Yeah, so what, I'm just yeah. interested in the underlying policy assumptions. If it's in a model like this, what are the underlying assumptions? So we built this using the best available science, of course. We compare our results against the other simulations that are out there, like the IEA and the integrated assessment models, so we know that it's consistent with theirs, but it's our own independent model. And what's underneath the hood are really important numbers, and policymakers, they don't just accept. They don't just say, oh, you guys seem smart. I believe your model. They shouldn't. They should say what's under the hood. So under here, it says assumptions, and many of the assumptions you can change. So explicitly, we've modeled how much oil and gas is remaining in the ground. And what is the progress ratio? Like, how fast do we learn in this area of renewables to say, well, as it grows, how much cheaper does it get with every doubling of cumulative capacity? What if it grows even more? So make the assumptions transparent and changeable because skeptical minds want to know. And give me a time check. How am I doing? One more minute. Then all at the same time, everyone just say your favorite solution all at the same time. One, two, three. Absolutely. So what, let's do it. Yeah, we need renewables. Yeah, we need carbon pricing. Yeah, we need energy efficiency. Yes, we need equity and global equity. We've got to look at energy prices. It's in there. We need to look at air quality, which is the big, a huge environmental injustice problem in equity. We've got to look at land use because when we go plant some trees, we've got to make sure who's on that land. We've got to cut deforestation. We've got to cut methane. Methane matters in F gases. 
and in cooling, F gases, all that's there, HFCs and SF6, all of that, maybe a little carbon removal, 1.7. Who would like 1.7? G1, 1.5. We need some magic in carbon removal, frankly, that we don't know what's going to happen. What about population? Yes, population is very hard to change, but boy, it is a little bit of something that changes uh, energy demand, but it is not a huge bender of the curve. But it is not the leverage point that people thought it was in 1971 when Ehrlich and the Meadows and everyone were saying, there's so many great, gosh, we want to build a fr an AI front end, but in the last nine seconds that I have here, let me just say, talk to Josh Lohman after this. He knows about AI a lot more than I do. Talk to me. And basically, this is a tool for governance. Go use n roads, n roads, Climate Interactive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Drew, and we'll come back hopefully with more more thorny questions, maybe after at the end of the session. Um, wonderful. So next, let's move to David Obora, who's the chair of the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, member of the Earth Commission, speaking in your personal capacity, I assume. <laughs> Over to you, David. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much, Maya. Uh, morning, everybody. Nice to be here. Somehow over here um, through the chaos um, so what I'll try and do in the time that I have I don't have any slides is um, I've been part of the Earth Commission so working on planetary and earth system boundaries with Johan Rockström et al I'm currently I've, since doing that work which I'm going to present a little bit now I've, I've been elected as the chair of IFBES um, and I won't be talking as IFBES but I've participated in the assessments and so on I think there's a lot of power the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, so the IPCC, but for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Um, so I'll try and make three points. One is that we have a range of interlocking crises, and everybody frames them somewhat differently, and it doesn't really matter how we frame them, so long as we deal with them, and it, it needs that those interconnections to be really addressed very carefully. The second point is it's equity. It's all about equity because the causes of the crises have been because of unequal access and consumption, uh, decision-making, and so on. And just by increasing equity, we'll be moving things in the right direction. The last presentation talked about bending the curve. We talk about that in biodiversity. We don't bend the curves of biodiversity loss if we don't bend the curves of energy consumption, for example, and of pollution. We have to, we have to bend all the curves. And if we do that in our individual areas, we can achieve the, uh, the overall outcome. And this needs transformation, transformation and both the willingness and commitment to change and shift pathways. And how do we do that? And that's very challenging. So thinking about Earth system and planetary boundaries, um, we, we know all the science policy interfaces, the global ones now are talking transformative change. We know we have to do a huge amount to bend the curves. Um, but they're very institutionalized processes, IPCC is, IPES is, there are other ones on food, on health, uh, on chemicals, uh, and various items, but they're all siloed in their particular places. There's a lot of discussion about how you bring them together, and the report that, that Maya mentioned that the commission put out addresses those issues. Um, and I did a little bit of work um, I guess about a year ago with the Global Challenges Foundation trying to identify, well, so what are the opportunities we have to try some of these gaps? Um, now, one of the really prominent um, parts, I think, in the new and emerging science in planetary and earth system boundaries is the realization that it's not just all about carbon. It's not just all about individual indicators out there of things going wrong. It's about the complexity of what feeds into those. And again, this comes to understanding that, that it, we need a equity of perspectives, equality of perspectives in looking at the various drivers. So it's not just CO2 and energy emissions. You also have to look at food production. You have to look at biodiversity loss. You have to look at how do people manage living in hot 
in hot climates where we need to consume more energy, uh, you know, in order to, to be able to do that. So balancing across these various elements is critical, and the social part of that is, of course, very critical, both in terms of how do people make decisions, uh, how do you appeal to them, you don't just show them more science, but you really need to get experiences and thinking out there. Um, and how do you understand what is the, you know, how do you, how do you bridge this huge divide in the sciences between the natural sciences that tell us where things are going on Earth systems and the social sciences that tell us about what people are doing, uh, why they do things, what their commitments and beliefs are, and how do you get them to, to move uh, in, those, in those regards. So on the governance side and the responses to Earth system crises, so we're struggling to find how we do that. Um, of course, we have the science policy interfaces but we need to get science policy society, the SPS, we're talking about S, um, science policy in action. Um, the high level uh, ambition board on effective multilateralism on the UN Secretary General's office has put out a few proposals. The Secretary General has himself as well, this emergency platform for dealing with, with uh, planetary and global crises. But how, to, how it should be designed, how to activate it, what it should focus on, are very challenging to work out and it's and it's very hard to plan that ahead of time because we're facing new challenges we don't really know what's coming at us uh, so it's very hard to plan that ahead of time um, and one of the things that i think seeing how our institutions work is that we can't just break down all these institutions and start new ones you know they, they're already doing some things well they're doing some things very poorly and those need to be improved and reformed but you build on what you have and you don't necessarily do it by planning as well. And a key thing is identifying across all of these different sectors, I think the sustainable development goals are a really good framework for this, is how do you ensure the interconnectivity across the various areas of work that you need to do? So you can have amazing models that can knit together the things that we can really quantify well and we can pull data into those and we can estimate things. There's a lot of things we can't necessarily quantify and we need we need people to think and understand across these divides. And so in thinking about a way to, to bridge um, the gaps amongst these science policy interfaces, the idea of establishing small sort of expert task forces that deal with critical problems, like the, the problem that you identified in India that you had. You had a small independent group say, hey, we can help you work on this. And the government, which had the mandate, initially thinking, hey, second, we don't know where this is coming from. But as you build up credibility, you show that you can connect things together. So I think that's, th those are the directions uh, I think we need to go in uh, that I'd like to bring to the large sort of national science policy interfaces. There's a lot of discussions uh, at high levels looking at how to bring this together, but we need innovation coming up from the sciences. Just coming back to IPBES and what IPBES is doing in, in the nature of our sort of institutional processes, We've all seen these challenges coming, and in the way of these large institutional processes, IPBES and IPCC, we, we mandate these large global reports, and it takes four to five years for these reports to come through. But in doing so, they do actually address some of these issues that we need to face. But what we need to do is, is have the courage to pick out these key nuggets, interconnectivity and solutions that come through. Uh, so the nexus assessment under IPBES is looking at the interlinkages across climate, uh, biodiversity, food, water, health. There's a transformative change assessment, trying to understand how do we transform? How do people, you know, what are the barriers? How do we overcome those? They will have limitations, of course, but they provide a lot of opportunities to connect multiple threads together. And so I hope that as, as it best moving forward, we can help contribute to this process of seeing what are these, you know, little nuggets that really make sense that we can amplify and find a space to help them connect these larger scale global processes together. I'll finish with that. Thanks. Thanks, David, for another excellent uh, presentation. Really fascinating, amazing work you and colleagues are doing. So we'll just round out our panelists with Alan Ware from the Mobilizing and Earth Governance Alliance. And also he's a founder of Global Coordinator of the Network of Parliamentarians for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament. Um, and talking about smart coalition techniques and innovation in terms of our earth governance system transformations. Uh, thanks so much, Maya. And uh, today I'm wearing a different hat, which is, well, I'm going to be introducing MEGA, the Mobilizing Earth Governance Alliance, but the hat I'm wearing is uh, the World 
Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy, uh, which I'm working as the program director. And John Vlasto is here. He's the, uh, the chair of the uh, executive committee or the board um, of World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy. We're part of the coalition that's pulling together, mobilizing an Earth Governance Alliance, which is online already, but it hasn't yet been launched. So this is a bit of a preview of what's to come and what we're building together, and we welcome your participation. Uh, what we're looking at doing with mobilizing Earth Gums Alliance is turning some of these ideas into policy action, building cooperation amongst environmental organizations and working with like-minded governments. Um, and we're coming sort of hot on the heels of the, the release of the report of the Climate's Governments Commission, which Maya introduced, uh, which we recommend you read. It's got some incredibly good proposals um, on environmental governance, uh, not just climate governance, it goes a bit broader than, than just the climate because it's, it's linked with other environmental issues also. Um, and these are well-researched proposals that the Climate Governance Commission has evaluated in order to see what can be effective, what can make a difference, and how they can work together. Um, and this is really important to do that. Uh, so we're coming on the, on, on the heels of that in order to provide a platform that civil society and governments can cooperate to take some of these proposals and ideas forward. Now, some of them are already in the form of campaigns, already have a, a small coalition of organizations behind them. You know, for example, the initiative to make Ecocide, you know, a, a new international, uh, the, um, the, um, the uh, proposal for a non a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. Uh, these have got campaigns behind them. The Earth Trusteeship Initiative has got a campaign behind also. Um, but some of them haven't got campaigns yet, and no doubt they'll be turned into campaigns at some stage through the cooperation of organizations. So what we're doing with MEGA is providing a platform where you can find out what are, what are the, these proposals, what are these campaigns, who's working on them, where are they getting traction so that you can become engaged and, and find out how you can get engaged and who you might want to work with if there's a particular proposal or proposals that are most interested to you and your organization, you know how to get engaged. We do have a flyer on this, which uh, if you haven't already got one, please grab one. Of course, that highlights the Climate Governance Commission report because that's where many of the proposals are coming from. There's a few additional ones as well, but that's where many of them come from. Um, and then the website itself. Now, part of the basis for us coming in this, the World Federalist Movement, is that we have done this before with a government's issue, not on the climate. Uh, this one was more on uh, uh, international individual responsibility uh, for war crimes and crimes against humanity. So it's our organization, World Federalist Movement, that formed the Coalition for the International Criminal Court. Um, and so that's sort of like a model here that can be replicated to some degree. It's not exactly the same. That one governance mechanism, the idea establishing an international criminal court, we built a coalition on that, worked with like-minded countries, and we now, of course, have the criminal court established. Uh, there have been a number of cases already in the court on individual personal responsibility at the highest level. As you know, there's arrest warrants out now for the president of one of the P5 countries, President Putin, uh, for crimes against humanity conducted you know, in, the, in the operations in Ukraine. So even leaders can't escape uh, accountability uh, when you establish these international governance mechanisms at a high enough level and, and sufficiently well established. Uh, it's not perfect. There are still some gaps in jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. Uh, but once you get the um, governance mechanisms up and running, there's always opportunities for strengthening them as well. And that's one of the things with, with MEGA, the Mobilizing Earth Governance Alliance, we're not just looking at proposals for new governance mechanisms. We're also looking at some of the existing mechanisms and how they can be improved uh, or better used. One example, the International Court of Justice. We already have an International Court of Justice. Environmental cases can be taken to the International Court of Justice. Some have. Uh, Nauru took Australia and New Zealand over the, the phosphate mining, which devastated the environment of Nauru. Uh, New Zealand and Australia took France to the court over the atmospheric testing nuclear weapons in the Pacific. Uh, there are a number of other cases also on environmental issues. But there are a lot of environmental issues that could be taken to the International Court of Justice that haven't been. And that's because, well, that doesn't have strong jurisdiction yet. Only 74 countries accept 
the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. So one of the proposals in MEGA, uh, which is also crossing over with some other coalitions, one called War Not War, Legal Alternatives to War, better use of the International Court of Justice, is to build the acceptance of the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. 74 countries currently accept the compulsory jurisdiction. We want to build that up. And we're working already with a group of like-minded countries uh, that is encouraging you know, their colleagues, other countries, to accept the jurisdiction and to demonstrate the value of legal cases, not just to enforce the law, but also to help resolve conflicts. <clears throat> because many of the times when a case is taken to the International Court of Justice, it provides a space that takes it out of the political space and into the fact-based, the science-based, and the, and the law, and by applying those, often resolutions can be found. And in fact, with the International Court of Justice, over 90% of the, of the decisions of the International Court of Justice <clears throat> are accepted by both sides and implemented. It's a really successful mechanism, which is underrated and undervalued and underused. So we could elevate the use of that, for example, and that will help resolve some environmental conflicts. There's a really important environmental case in the court at the moment through a different approach, not through one country taking another country to the court, but another way of take, going to the court is what's called the advisory opinion process. That's how I got really involved in the court, was I was involved in taking a case to the International Court of Justice on the illegality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons about 25, 26 years ago. Uh, now, climate has been taken to the International Court of Justice through an advisory opinion my opinion is sort of a mess. It really is a proper case. It's not just like, you know, like going to your lawyer and asking for advice. A, a genuine case in the court. It's called an advisory opinion because it's not one country taking another country to the court. It's a UN body. In this case, it was the UN General Assembly asking the court, what is the legal status of this particular question? So the one they're doing on climate change is what are the obligations of states with respect to climate change? Um, and so we're now in the court, and there's a great opportunity to use that court, the, that court case, uh, in order to bring in a lot of principles of international law and strengthen them. We've got until January the 22nd for making submissions to the court, so that's the part of the process now. So that's just one of the many examples we have up on the mega website um, of existing governance measures and proposed to strengthen those, um, new proposals and campaigns. And we encourage you to, to use it. Uh, and if you've got proposals or no campaigns out there, let us know. We can also put them up. And we'll be doing a pub launch of this uh, early in the new year. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alan, for another great presentation. So that uh, rounds out our speakers. And now we can move uh, to questions. Uh, we have about 10 minutes. So any questions for our various speakers? I, can, I think we have a roving mic. Is there a roving microphone? Any questions on any of the presentations? <laughs> okay, thanks. So I suppose I'll, I'll take one then building on the equity issue because this is what I'm really interested in right now. So particularly in, in it's a global model that you've established. So does it have countries in it? So you can see what a policy of, you know, what the US or China does or something like that. And, and, and the follow on to that then is also income levels. Can you do it by, so maybe this is next stages, but then to, to put in income levels across countries, because there must be data on that that could be plugged in so you can see about. There's another model called C roads we were using here in this whole process, which is broken out by country. First 20, now six, where you explore the international issues. But that model is global and stays global because it needs to work in seven minutes in front of a group like this, and so it doesn't break it out by country. But someday it should, and another version could. Thank you. Other questions? <laughs> Amanda, do you have a question? Just to say thank you, Maya, for this incredible work and for bringing so many different coalitions together. So I have many comments. We, we thank you. We've been working with Enroads. We're so pleased to see them here, and also just thinking about how the 
interparliamentary union campaign that we're supporting, my, my Parliament, My Planet, Our Shared Global Future could potentially go on the website. And we're, we're featuring MIT En-ROADS, we're featuring the Climate Laws Database of the World from, MI, uh, from LSE, and then Climate Trace as well. So we're trying to gather together all the tools that then parliamentarians can look at and help it will help them make governance decisions. So, but thank you so much for all the work you're doing. And the commission launch was fantastic the other night too. Thank you. Wonderful, amazing. <laughs> Likewise, amazing work you're doing. Um, any other questions, uh, Alan? And then yes, or would you like to go our host? <laughs> Uh, actually, I come from Taiwan, and uh, recently I was invited by the OECD to talk about uh, climate governance. The, da the data, the digital and the climate and green, just our, our logo, digital and green. In Asia, most countries have problem. For example, the Japan, Korea, uh, they have the strong policy from top down, but the transparency and the open the data is a big issue. So uh, when the a new presidential, the, the governors change, everything changed. Nobody knows the real things. So I'm wondering how to solve this problem because the culture is totally different. When you, you when the government, we have a policy, we want to do something and they can, oh, it's good, but no data like MRT did. So, so I think the climate governors, how can we improve the local government, how to reduce their and educate them, the climate governance is very, very important. Amazing, great, great questions. And um, Amanda had mentioned uh, the climate trace tool and at the ASU pavilion, I'll tell you, it's going to be, we're having a session on the fourth, no, the fourth or the fifth, the fifth, sorry, uh, in the afternoon at 2.30 with climate, an expert from Climate Trace, which, and they monitor from open source and other academic uh, colleagues to track emissions for, for fixtures across the world. And it's very accurate in terms of like transparency in terms of emissions. But you're also talking about education at all levels about technology and policy innovation, which is another excellent point about the education and support for policymakers that we need. Um, and yeah, we've been talking to We'll talk after this, <laughs> but we were talking to recently LSE Grantham Institute and uh, another institution, um, a, a few institutions uh, about how we establish like a policy clearinghouse hub for international policy learning and exchange. But your point about it, it has to filter down to all levels, right? Yeah, so that's a really interesting. How can it assist in that respect? So thanks, excellent questions to be continued. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Probably we will invite you to come to uh, have some uh, thing for the higher level, uh, how to do the climate governance. Uh, I think very important in Asia because some most of the country they just want to have a huge funding uh, from the top down. But you know that when everything change, lots of policy changes. So even we don't know the such kind of policy can reduce the temperature. Uh, however, some country claim their emission is more. When they use the MIT's uh, your your platform, oh no use at all. <laughs> so that, that's also another problem. I mean, so so by my being my, being my honest, I'm from the NGO, and I would like to use uh, probably in the future working with you to do something to educate the policymaker how to do this. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Uh, very much welcome that, and let's be in touch. <laughs> Excellent. Other questions for our. Amazing panelists, comment. Oh, Alan, you have. Uh, so I have a example because that's so important. Firstly, the Interparliamentary Union is a really helpful organisation to engage with because it is the international body of parliaments. 178 parliaments, 180, thanks, 180, I've been corrected, parliaments are members of the IPU. So they're official members of this. So this gives some clout. Um, and they meet twice a year in the assemblies, so will adopt resolutions, and they have done some on the climate. What the problem is, though, is that the parliaments, even though they're a member of the IPU, they haven't given it sufficient authority so that when they're adopting these resolutions, they never have any follow-up back in the parliaments. And they should be. Once a resolution is adopted, they should then go back and report and have a session in the parliament on implementation of the IPU resolution. 
they don't do that. But that's something that we can do, even though it may not be so official, and that's what we've been, our organisation's been doing. It's been organising FOB events in parliaments with the delegates to the IPU so that we actually have like a, a way of event into the, into the parliaments. Uh, we've been doing that. I've been working more on the nuclear disarmament side because that's my background. But the climate parliament, which was a set, set up by Nick Dunlop and has 2,000 parliamentarians involved, is doing that more and more also on the climate side. So that's improving, making better use of that mechanism that is already there, the interparliamentary union. What we're also doing is proposing that there be an even stronger interparliamentary organisation, a United Nations Union is not an organ of the United Nations. It was set up independently a long time before. It was set up back in, it was set up even before the League of Nations. Yeah. Um, but, it, but it doesn't have, an, it's not an official organ of the UN. So anything that the IPU does, the UN can listen to it, but they don't have to do anything about it. That's a problem. We want a parliamentary body that the UN has to pay attention to. So that's why there's also a proposal for UN Parliamentary Assembly, which has an even stronger position within the UN bodies than what the IPU has. Now, it may be that IPU could transform into that, or it may need a whole new one. We're not too sure what's the best way of going about that, uh, but both those, th those proposals are there. Thank you, Alan. Um, any last comments or questions before we close? I don't think so. Okay, so it just uh, is with me to thank you all for coming. Thanks to speakers for the really excellent presentations. Great conversation and look forward to working with all of you uh, going forward. So thanks so much. And thanks again for our amazing hosts here in the pavilion. Yeah. <laughs>